Well, here we are back on Zoom worship. This all virtual reality, as I said at the start, in case you missed it, is in part because there's no internet at the church building and that is due to cables being knocked down by a tree from the storm. So that's a very typical Hope UCC thing, trees knocking down cables and uh, our building giving us some grief. But we are also all virtual in part due to the COVID surge that is kind of confusing and zapping us all again and triggering us and putting us back into risk analysis mode if we ever left risk analysis mode. I know that my parents of kids under five have had especially long go of this with still no vaccine for their little ones. And we here we are doing that analysis again. We have to assess what things are worth it to risk exposure to COVID and what are all the steps and precautions that we take when we do them. We suffer pain when people may say to us that we aren't worth it uh, and we want to greet them. And with so much analysis and prep, we may end up just deciding that some things are easier to do all virtually. But we, when we are in an all virtual situation though, I find it hard to distinguish between my experiences because they are all basically in the same mode, staring at this computer screen, right? How is worship different from a work meeting? How is that different from a social conversation? How is that different from just watching a newscast or YouTube video? How are they different when they all are in the same place and in the same mode? All those types of experiences and interactions used to look different and feel different from one another. They used to be in different locations. They used to be with different people. I would often look and feel differently. I certainly would not be wearing my fuzzy slippers, which I am wearing now. So th those things are all different. One of the things that's really different about virtual experiences is the prep, the preparation. There isn't any for all virtual, or there is very, very little compared to in-person experiences. For the virtual, one minute we're having breakfast, boom, the next minute we are at worship. Or we could attend worship and we could be doing other things at the same time. I know some of you are washing dishes right now. I know, right? We could be driving a car and going to worship. And that certainly changes the experience. For in-person worship or other gatherings, I used to like, and I still like, to, to have a little preparation time. I like to be prepared. I like to think ahead. I like to wake up. I like to take a shower and get dressed. I like to drive to the place. I like to drive to our sanctuary. How do you like to prepare before you have experiences? And is your preparation different for an in-person experience versus a virtual one? Mine definitely is. And so I miss that preparation for the in-person stuff. Do you miss preparation? Why? As we think about that, you think about that while I talk more about it. Preparation is a drawing out of the experience that is coming. It is actually part of that experience. It's the waiting, the anticipating. I think preparation for something actually changes the experience that's coming. Worship is more meaningful because many different people have prepared together for it, contributed to it, thought about it, and then come together for the shared experience. Christmas is more joyful because of Advent preparation. Work meetings are more fruitful when we have planned in advance for them and we arrive differently for the experience. 
Preparation is important. That's what we're about today. Preparation is important. And in the first century, Jewish people thought so too. They loved preparation, loved it. They had rituals to prepare for their rituals. Preparation to prepare to do the ritual. Everything needed a little advanced thought. And it is in that context of rituals of preparation that we read about Jesus' baptism by John today. And that may not be what you immediately think about when you think about baptism. Think about preparation. It's easy to think about how we experience baptism and like project it back on to this story. But baptism for us has quite a few differences from baptism at that time. Baptisms now are about affirming how loved someone is by God, as you heard me talk with the kids about. It's about welcoming them into our community. It's about showering them with all of God's love and grace. And that that has always been with them since their birth. But that isn't always, isn't always what baptism was about, especially back then especially before this scene, this scene really changed with God descending down and saying how much God loved Jesus. That changed it right then. But before that, there were lots of different kinds of baptisms. So scholars Rolf Jacobson and Matt Skinner explain, quote, there were lots of baptisms in the ancient world for different purposes. Baptism in the ancient world doesn't necessarily mean a cleansing, although that was part of it, but a lot of rituals that were preparatory, end quote. So people wanted to be at their best for all kinds of things, and they prepared for that with washing or cleansing before doing those special things, like going to the temple, entering the house, their own house on the Sabbath, eating meals together, and so on. They believed that doing all kinds of normal things made them unclean and they needed to be cleansed again. That can all seem a little weird and shameful to us. Potentially, we don't like the word unclean, maybe, but it was not necessarily for them at that time. In the Old Testament, being unclean is not the same thing as being sinful. Being unclean is just part of life. Many of the unclean things were physical that they that when they needed to feel like they needed to wash it off would be regular life things like getting your food together, butchering meat or menstruating. That was expected. You had to have that was coming. And there were also spiritual things too that needed to be cleansed like maybe you fought with your family or your coworkers. But that was expected. And it was those regular life things that then you would need to set down as you prepared for special things, the way you moved in to getting ready for special things. So in that way, baptisms at that time are kind of more like our prayer of confession and words of assurance today, if that makes sense. Uh, we expect that life would have happened throughout the week. And we need to prepare ourselves to hear God's spirit move again in worship. And the way we prepare ourselves for that is to say lots of things happened during this week. We did things, things happened to us. We absorbed pain and the whole world has things that are wrong with it. And so God, in preparation to meet you, we acknowledge that and we are assured of your love and presence. That's what baptisms more were like at that time. So we expect all of that. So Matt Skinner continues, quote, you wash yourself in the first century Judaism, not because you have done something wrong or sinful, but in order to prepare yourself for what is next, end quote. Preparation. So because of that, there were tons of these baptisms and washing rituals. And that is the context for Jesus coming to visit John. 
Jesus was coming in preparation for something. He was coming in preparation for what was coming next. He couldn't just turn on his computer and zoom into his ministry with no preparation. He needed to anticipate, to prepare, and the world needed to anticipate and to prepare. What was Jesus preparing for? What were they all waiting for? In a way, they didn't know. They couldn't have known that the spirit would descend in that moment, blessing Jesus with love. They couldn't have known that Jesus would teach truths, perform miracles, and create community forever and ever. They couldn't have known that he would face trial and execution on a cross. They couldn't have known that he would rise again in the same spirit and same blessing. They couldn't have known. And yet they were preparing for it all the same. We don't always know what God will do, but we prepare for it all the same because we trust that God will do something and that God is faithful to us. That's why we perform baptisms, why we go to church, why we pray. That is why we do those things together as community. Because we trust that God will do something. And our preparation for that thing makes such a difference. And it makes a real big difference when we do it together. The writer of Luke in this story also emphasizes the together part. He emphasizes that as well. Because that's my final point. Luke emphasizes this preparation, not just for Jesus, but for all the people around. Because Luke is one of the only gospel writers that really includes the crowd as part of this experience. Luke writes that the crowd was waiting. The crowd was expecting. They were not just a passive part of this experience. Another commentator, Shively Smith, writes, quote, Luke opens this by describing the people. This scene opens with the people, not with John, not with Jesus. Those observing John's actions then asked questions filled with expectation and introspection. In the Gospel of Luke, the Greek term prosdokeo means waiting. It means expecting, giving thought to something that is yet unknown, has yet to be manifest. This word, this Greek word of looking forward that this crowd was doing, it means to look forward to future possibilities. These people were preparing expectantly. They were present. They were asking questions. They were active. God's people are part of what God does. We are part of what God does. We are an active part. So in this scene, Jesus was preparing, and so were the people. They were anticipating. Something unknown was coming, and God was going to do something. They all needed to be prepared. In this pandemic season, how do we get prepared for what God might do? How will we even notice when God does something? Right now at Hope, we have taken a little bit of time to do some intentional preparation, to do some listening. We're calling it the ministry Sabbath. And like the crowd at the baptism, it's not passive, it is active. It means we are anticipating what is to come. We are listening for the spirit. We are open to the unknown and to things moving in the spirit. When some things have been removed, like our drive to the church building or our setup of certain things, maybe other opportunities have been added that we need to look for and notice with more intention. So we are focused a little less on doing and a little more on the spirit and preparation. 
our baptisms, our work for justice, our worship, all of it, how are they part of God's preparation? How are they blessed by the spirit of God descending like a dove? Let us use this season of rest and renewal to prepare, to prepare our hearts and our heads and our hands and our community for all that God has in store for us. Let us trust and let us hope that God does have a future in store for us and it is blessed. Amen. <laughs>